Hello, today we're going to be looking at a question on Apple uh, Apple market share, uh, which was from a few years ago, about um, whether this is in the consumer interest or not. So there's quite a lot to unpack from this question. So when, if you've got this, you can be thinking about what it relates to. So we've got the consumer interest. We might want to define consumer interest as we start. And I'm going to define consumer interest in this as low price, high utility, and we're going to measure that through consumer surplus. So throughout the essay, we can be referring back to consumer surplus, and we want to define that at the beginning of the essay. Moreover, we would want to perhaps link market share to market power, because really, this question is a question about market power and contestability. So is it uh, in the consumer interest for a company to have high levels of market power? And that enables them to raise price and limit output, and that implies something uh, to do with barriers to entry and, again, what we said before about contestability. Right, they, these are the areas that we have. What I'd like to do is to pause the video right now and just to think of to yourself about what kind of application could you bring into this essay and what would your two points be? It's quite interesting that this essay you wouldn't have specifically prepared this market. You wouldn't be able to know about, for example, the exact profits levels of Apple. You wouldn't necessarily know that, but you do have common sense knowledge of this market. Many of you use Apple phones, and so you'd know about the product. And I think that's why they've chosen this as a, an example product. So pause the video, think about that, and come back in a minute. Right, so first point would be needing to use this diagram here, which is your uh, diagram showing that you have a degree of monopoly power using the downward sloping demand curve. Now, um, we'd want to say, first of all, that it is actually a technical monopoly. It has 38% of market share. And just from your own knowledge, we all know that Apple can raise prices. It's so simple. We can say that an iPhone is an expensive product. It's Many of them are over £1,000 for just one model. So that, is, that sort of shows you that clearly they're able to raise price and they have market power. <laughs> The linking that to the lack of close substitutes would be very useful, and that then refers back to the price elasticity of demand. Now, your standard standard um, logical chains of reasoning, you'd want to define where MC equals MR. You'd want to show the level of supernormal profit, this area here around there. You would want to then um, show that that's a signal for other firms to enter the market. And... That's where our barriers to entry come in, because clearly a large supernormal profit means that other firms are willing to enter, but barriers to entry may well mean that they're unable to enter. The use of patents, for example, uh, um, perhaps Face ID or some of the area elements of iOS, um, economies of scale, perhaps that would be the technical economies of scale of within their factories, perhaps that would be the bulk buying of the screens or, or, or whatever it is, the marketing, branding economies of scale, and brand loyalty. You can really unpack that and use your common sense to show you understand barriers to entry with reference to this specific market. Now, if it were a competitive industry, we would be producing where MC equals AR or P equals MC. Remember, AR is just price. Um, and so you'd have a different output level. You would have your outputs Q star and you'd have a, a price of P star over here. So you'd have this different equilibrium over there. And that gives us a nice, uh, a nice comparison because now we can say that uh, consumer surplus would be in a competitive market X y p star which is all of this area here but it is being reduced by the monopolist to x a p1 there i'm sorry about my those triangles they're not very good um and that would give you a reduced level of p1 a y p star so you've got your consumer surplus reduced and now you can really get into answering the question that it's not benefiting consumers because they've lost out of consumer surplus there is a dead weight loss loss of a y z this area here all of that area there is your loss of consumer uh, uh, your dead weight loss of social surplus and even more if you wanted to add a little bit more p1 avp star p1 avp star this area, and I'm getting too many areas here, but I've got my area here going out to AV. That is appropriated by the monopolist. It is taken, it's its consumer surplus, which has been taken away from the consumer. 
and been transferred to the monopolist. And that's really illustrating very nicely that it is not acting in the consumer's interest. And therefore, we are both allocatively and productive efficient, inefficient. And this is the typical argument against monopolies. Uh, Rent-seeking behaviour uh, it is negative, uh, and we would therefore seek to perhaps regulate them uh, in the UK through the CMA, or the Competition and Markets Authority. Now, let's, now, have a think about this, because this doesn't really make sense, I think, in, in real life. So let's think about the PED, the price elasticity of demand, and what arguments could you get from that which might... Um, help you to argue that it is in the consumer interest. Okay, well, let's first of all um, think about what the magnitude of P star to P1 would be. So how far has the monopolist raised price? Well, that would depend on the price elasticity of the de of demand for the good. And this is where you can really um, get into some nice application. You could look at, well, how close are the substitutes in the market? And we know that there are new entrants in the market, Oppo, Vivo, Huawei, these kind of companies have entered the market, and it suggests the barriers to entry perhaps aren't as high as we might think they are. Now, if there are a large number of close substitutes, it might mean that Apple have a limited ability to raise its price without consumers leaving and buying other goods. That if the percentage change in uh, fall in quantity demanded is greater than the percentage increase in price when Apple raises its um, price, then that might mean that they are less in, in, inclined to do so. Um, we might go into a little bit more detail as to why. So clearly there's advances in technology at the moment that might allow more people to get into the market. Patents are probably not as strong as they used to be. Um, it's easier to um, Im employ other firms to build chips for you, to build screens, and you just put them together into a package. And you could, and I think a really nice um, point here is that well, you could look at Apple's actual behavior. And clearly at the bottom of the market, it is very competitive. The iPhone SE is an example of a cheaper phone. It's around £400. And therefore, it's competing at the bottom of the market, suggesting that Apple are needing to drop their prices in order to compete, suggesting at this area of the market, they have relatively elastic demand. And therefore, that is acting in the consumer interest. Um, now, other phones do remain expensive, but all of this is, I think, showing us that consumers have choice. If they want to buy an expensive good, they can. If they want to buy a cheap good, they can. And there are plenty of substitutes at all areas of the market. So it suggests that Apple actually is working to the benefit of consumers. It's not reducing the number of alternatives that consumers can access. And actually, its actions are simply providing more choice and better quality products to the rest of the market. Right, our next point, somewhat implied by what I just said there, is innovation and economies of scale. Um, pause the video, what can you get out of this point? It's always nice for the second point in an essay like this to use an economies of scale diagram. So see what you can get from there in real life application from the Apple Apple's business. Okay, coming back. So um, <coughs> clearly, um, if we go back to this diagram, we can make a very simple comparison. There are firms without economies of scale, they would have high long run average costs of C1. Firms such as Apple, who are larger, you might argue, uh, are able to get to their MES. We could say that's the minimum efficient scale. And as a result, they have lower average cost of production, which we might argue is in the benefit of the consumers. Now, we, before we do that, we want to show that we have understanding of what barriers to entry, uh, what, what economies of scale are. Uh, we might talk about marketing, technical, and purchasing economies of scale. Apple have huge marketing campaigns. They divide that large cost, total cost of their advertising campaigns across a large number of units of production, allowing the unit cost of their marketing to be relatively low. Um, likewise, technical, the use of very large machines, for example, and complex capital equipment is divided across a large number amount of output. Um, now, you could argue, well, they are able to only able to operate at a minimum efficient scale because they have monopoly power, because they are large. And so that would allow them to charge lower prices and therefore would be in the consumer interest. Consumer surplus would be higher and this would be better. 
You could alternatively argue that, well, they might also use their supernormal profit. That uh, in increase in um, supernormal profit might be going back into their investment, into research and development, or in R&D there. And again, just use some simple things that you know about Apple iPhones. The Face ID, the camera technology, iOS, battery life, whatever it is. And that then improves the ex consumer experience. And you might add that actually a high priced, high quality good may still yield very high consumer surplus. So the good we're talking about might be different and therefore might be worth buying for the consumer. So as a result, low prices and or a better quality product benefit consumers. Now, in our evaluation, a very common evaluation of all of those, that just because you have cost advantages doesn't mean to say that you're going to pass them on to the consumer. And many companies simply use their those for dividend payments, as we can see there. Um, Apple's prices are much higher than the competition. Use your real life understanding of the market. Then clearly, because their prices are higher, that suggests that the competition also have are at minimum efficient scale, have high um, economies of scale, and therefore that's not unique to Apple, and therefore you don't need necessarily need monopoly high levels of monopoly power to achieve that. Um, however, we could certainly say that there is continual in innovation. We know there's a new iPhone every year, and it changes and becomes better, and therefore you might say that its economies of scale and cost advantages give it larger supernormal profits, which it has been diverting into its innovation. Um, but I'm not sure if that's even, again, unique to Apple. It may well be that other phone companies are doing that as well. So there's a scope there for lots of discussion using real life knowledge of your market for the um, in this market, which I think everyone should have, given that you all buy uh, these types of goods and use them. Right, finally, judgment. See what you can find. What does this whole essay hinge around? Are you going to come to a very clear judgment and what does it depend on? Think about that and come back in a couple of minutes. Right, in judgment, um, we don't want to rehash all of our arguments. Again, we want to make a real clear conclusion. And clearly, it is dependent on our consumer preference and our contest and the contestability of the market. If the pre preference is for lower prices, then Apple does not seem to be benefiting consumers. It is providing high price products, um, at a very high price point, but high quality. However, even if you say that, Apple's behavior is not necessarily anti-competitive. It doesn't limit, or it doesn't seem to be limiting, the cheaper substitutes which are available in the market. So even if you can say that it's, it, it doesn't benefit consumers in this way, it still doesn't prevent consumers from buying the alternatives. Now, you could also argue that, well, because Apple has been successful, then perhaps for many consumers, the quality of its products through its innovation, its brand, means that the, the benefits to consumers actually outweigh the costs of the higher prices. And we know this, that people who are Apple fans, they, they love the products and they're willing to pay for the really premium prices for them as you can see from the iPhone Pro um, and, and the, the, all of the new products that they're coming out with um, at the top of the market. And ultimately, I think you could come down in, in this argument to say, well, over time, this is clearly is an example of a contestable market. It is one where the incumbent firms, the firms in the market, are having to work hard to keep ahead of the market trends, to keep ahead of the technology and innovate their products in the in fear of potential entrants coming in and taking their market share. And therefore, we can say that it is reacting to few, uh, consumer preferences into the future. And therefore, it is acting ultimately in the long run in the consumer interest. And I think we should be very clear about this. And if I were to write this essay, I would write very clearly, Apple are acting in the consumer interest and therefore should be allowed to continue with their 38% market share. Right, hope that hope that was clear. Hope you enjoyed the video and do like and subscribe.